Part A. And then take it away, Brian. Let's get started. Yeah, you're you're not. I'm just okay. kidding. I'm not on mute. Right? <laughs> oh, you know what? <laughs> oh god! I had like five of those today, where I'd be I'd be on a Zoom, and somebody went on for like ten minutes, and they really were on mute, and you flag them down, they don't pay attention. So, oh god! Well, well, you know that could be the dream, Brian on mute constantly. Listen, ask and you shall receive. I know. I better watch it, huh? All right, welcome everybody to Tech Talk Law. Our guest today is Nakia Gray. Nakia is an expert, and we can actually say that, in virtual law firms. Nakia used to work in a physical law firm and has taken the idea of virtual law firms to the next level, which is something I think that is very ripe for all of us today in this COVID pandemic. Um, you know, just this morning on the news, I'm seeing stories where uh, companies that plan to be closed at least through 2020 are now expanding that through 2021. Um, large companies, small companies, and the like. Obviously, there's hurdles, um, but luckily, we are in a technological revolution, and there's lots of tools and tricks and tips, and we're going to go over those today. And at any time, if you guys have questions, use the chat feature, send them out so Nakia can address them. Okay? So welcome, Nakia. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I have been running a virtual law firm for the last five years, since 2015. I had no idea what a virtual law firm even was at the time when I started mine. I just knew that I really um, wanted to have the freedom to practice law from anywhere. And really it came from a, a place of a, um, a personal preference um, and personal issues going on in my life. My husband and I had decided that I, would, I needed to um, come home to homeschool. I had been working at a local firm and I was a heavy litigator at the time, actually, for about eight years. And um, so, you know, we decided that I was going to come home and homeschool. And I wasn't really ready to completely leave the law. So I had to figure out a way that I could um, homeschool my daughter and still practice um, on a part-time basis. And virtual law firm was really it. And that's been um, just an amazing thing. I've grown so much in these last five years. Things have changed so much um, that we're even having a tech talk on virtual law. I mean, when I first started, it was like, virtual what? You mean virtual office? People didn't even know what it was at that time. So um, it's been a really a great journey and I, I love it. Have you given up litigation? I have given up litigation. Okay, so virtual law office might not be conducive to all practices of law, except right now, of course, where our litigation is all online. Right. Well, or could, it be? Or could it be, Nakia? Does, yeah. Can you still continue in a virtual law firm, even if you are a litigator? I would like to hear about that as well. I think absolutely. I think that the, um, the, the virtual aspect of it and what it really means to practice law virtually is really the delivery of legal services online. And you can do that across any practice area. I mean, yes, you may have to actually go into court if you're in a jurisdiction that has open courts, but in terms of how you, um, how you navigate through the process of litigation, how you um, do your research, your staff is virtual, how you meet with your clients can be virtual. It can still be completely virtual, but you just show up for court. So I do think that even in litigation, um, you can still be, still have a virtual law practice. Do you think there's some kind of stigma for being a virtual lawyer? I mean, maybe right now, no, but I know I actually took my firm virtual in that I don't have a physical office um, about a year and a half, two years ago. And I, you know, when clients would come in, they actually came in and may, met with me. I have a space where I can meet with clients if I really wanted to meet with them in person. And I just felt so awkward because it really wasn't my office. You know, I didn't have my stuff in it. And of course, I don't want them at my house. Um, and some of them really wanted to meet in person. And so I felt like not having that actual office created some type of stigma. So I'll tell you, I think number one, it, it depends on your clients and your clientele. And so I work primarily with creatives and entrepreneurs and they don't have time to come to my office. They could care less what my office looks like. They love Zoom. They love to be able to share their screens with me and show me what they're working on and that kind of thing. So that was, that was definitely not, not an issue for my clientele. But I think even if you have clients um, that maybe aren't so out, the box like that. I think that it's all about your marketing message and your branding and how 
you are positioning your firm. Um, I've always on my website and in anything, all of my marketing, I've always made the virtual aspect about them, not about me. It's not about me being comfortable. It's not about me saving money and not having a big office. It is about me being respectful of your time, me saving you from having to pay to park downtown to drive yeah. to my office, me. So, and I, and I also have found that when you offer people both options, it's, it's all in the delivery. So when you are um, dealing with clients and you're completely virtual, I always lead with, well, we um, have, uh, you know, we can meet with you virtually. You don't have to leave your home. If you are someone who prefers to meet in person, we totally have that option available. But when you say that and they feel like you're not trying to hide something by not having to meet in person, a lot of times they opt for the virtual option but I always made it about it being more convenient for them. And that they tend to, to come around to so much more, but I've never had anybody, because um, even though I am virtual, I still have a co-working space just because I like cute offices. And so I don't, I do not, no client has ever seen my office other than on Zoom. But, um, but I just like to have a place that I can go to. Plus, because I was home and homeschooling my daughter for so long, when she left to go to college, I was like, I'm out of here. I just wanted to be around adults. Um, and so being in a co-working space and being able to meet, and there's lots of lawyers here where I am. There's, you know, all kinds of professions. And so I like that. I am a very social person. So I didn't want to be just at home. And what did you use for virtual at the time? So if you were meeting with a client pre-COVID, were you using Zoom? Were you using FaceTime? Were you just using the telephone? The yeah, old-fashioned telephone? Know. <laughs> I have been a Zoom uh, since I, when I started my practice on February 16th of 2015, I had a Zoom Pro account. So I've always been on Zoom. I, every single meeting that I had was on Zoom. And I liked Zoom, again, about giving them those options. I always, uh, on my website, people would book directly. So it would say it's a video, we prefer to do it by video conference. However, if you prefer just to call in or, or be on by phone, you can call in by phone. So I've always um, met clients uh, on Zoom. Well, okay. um, so what, you, what else, so Zoom is a popular tool. Everybody's using Zoom right now for, for you know, video conferencing and what have you. What are your top three other favorite tools, technology devices, anything that you use that you think is critical for those wanting a virtual law place. And now, you know, let's let's have a caveat. So I'm I enjoy having a virtual legal space. I also maintain a physical office. So some people are going to be purely virtual. Some people are going to be purely physical. Um, I think a lot of us are now on this fence of maybe having a dual role. So maybe you you can if there's if it's niche specific, say that. But otherwise, I want to hear your top three. Oh, you know, I hate having to limit it to just three, but um, you can do 12. It's fine. We'll start. <laughs> going. Okay. Definitely the video conferencing. And so for me that it's zoom, zoom is just, it's just the greatest. Um, and they've made so many improvements to it um, uh, since COVID. So definitely zoom case management software. I think no matter what kind of um, practice area you have, having a centralized web-based platform. I personally use my case. I have left my case and gone to Clio and then I went back to my case. I have done Practice Panther. I left my case and with the Practice Panther, I came back to my case. I am a my case girl. So my case is it for me. Um, but it's a great place for the clients to, and they have made tremendous improvement. I mean, every day, every week, there are new features with my case and it does everything. So my yeah. intake is done there, um, signing the retainer agreements, payments, um, documents, uploading, calendaring, billing, I mean, everything. So I definitely having that, whether you are you know, partially virtual or fully virtual or complete brick and mortar, having a great case management software is key. And so it has wait, an let's app. Let's, oh, and, it has an app. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question. So my office, we had never had case management software before. And so... You know, we did a lot of research. Um, I wound up going with Clio. And so a firm of my size, there's a lot of things that I do like about Clio. There's a few things that I don't like. I have some issues with some billing. You know, we take non-refundable retainers. That's been an issue for us with the way Clio applies it. What is it about, for my own selfish needs that I want to know, what do you like about my case as opposed to Clio? 
So I or practice I, Panther or what have you, any so of them. I'll tell you the number one reason that I came back to my case every single time. It's two reasons, but the number one is that I have a fairly nice sized staff and team. And so there's a lot of people. I've got an intake person. I've got two paralegals. I've got two attorneys all over the world, right? So my case, it's so, what's the best feature is that the tasks um, allow you to have conversations. And so, and, and it's, it's all in one place. So if the paralegal does something, she can say it. She's got a question, it's there. We can all see, everybody knows what's going on with every single case at every single moment. It was not easy to do that in Clio. It was horrible to do it in, um, in P Practice Panther. So if you are within a case, you can see every task and every comment that is made on those. And so for, for my team, that was crucial, being able to communicate as a team. Now, the second reason um, that the non-selfish reason is that clients like it so much better. My clients, mm -hmm. I, I migrated them from my case to Clio. They hated Clio. They didn't think it was user friendly. They couldn't find things. My case isn't as pretty looking. I think that the, you know, uh, aesthetically, Cleo looks better. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how it works for them, they just, they really liked my case better. And um, so those are the two reasons for me. But, but number one, for sure, is the ability for the team to collaborate and, and to, for everybody to work together. And I don't know, back then, Cleo didn't have the... Um, their leads or their intake was by, with Lexicata and it integrated with it, but with, I don't know if they've changed that now. I think that they have uh, Clio Grow or something like that. Yeah, it's a whole nother subscription. Okay, so see, in my case, the leads are, it's all in and you can easily convert a lead to a case. Um, so we, we use, that's, that's where we are. Okay, tool number two. Okay, that was tool number two. Number three, I would say, um, again, team oriented would be Voxer. This is my new favorite thing. Voxer, V-O-X-E-R is a, um, it's, you know, you've heard of probably Slack or, or those things that where you can communicate as a team. Voxer, I love because you can do it by voice. It's like a walkie talkie. Remember uh, Nextel had those, you know, walkie talkie phones. Voxer is great. You can use text or voice. And so it's also just great for me to be able to communicate with all of the pe different people on my team. I have some team members who are inside of the firm and then I have a lot of team members who are not inside of the firm. So they can't, they're not in my case. They are marketing or website um, tech graphics. So when I need to easily and quickly communicate with them, I love to just send a message. My business manager, I can just, send a message to her. I don't, even if I'm driving, I don't have to worry about texting. So those are, are probably my three. My case definitely for clients and team and then um, Voxer for communicating with the team and then video. Can I add, I've got to add one more. Number four, <laughs> got to add one more. And that's going to be Ring Central. That's the phone. As much as I try to not be on the phone, there are people and, and clients when they go to your website want to see a phone number and they want to call. And, um, and so having a VOIP phone system, VOIP stands for voice over internet phone system, which means you don't have to actually plug it into the wall. Um, it's a landline, but the land is really the internet. Um, and Ring Central allows you to do that. And it allows you to have multiple extensions. And so we, we have a full, you know, I've got seven, a seven extension phone platform that's you know like the old days of the switchboard, but it's on the internet, and so that um, that is that's another one that to me is really crucial. It has an app, so it's on your phone. You can text, you can, um, and it integrates with Zoom to do video conferencing as well. So if you, um, but it's I want to say the one that and it's fax has fax, um, electronic fax phone as well as the, uh, they have uh, Ring Central meetings or, or virtual uh, meetings, which is um, on the Zoom platform. So you're talking about collaboration with your clients and then collaboration with other lawyers or your team. 
for, uh, we have a question about collaborating with clients. You know, what other programs have you used that allow you to collaborate or give clients access to files, documents, things to share with them? I do, I do it all in my case. They, they get one thing. And, um, and when, they, uh, when they sign up, after they pay their retainer, they get a welcome email right. from us that, um, that explains to them that my case is where they go. So that's the one place that they get everything. All of their documents are there. Anything related to you know, meetings is there. Um, any tasks that I have to give them, uh, that's another great thing about my case is that you can assign tasks to clients as well, not just the team. So they only have to know one login and one password, everything we do in my case. Okay. So, so do you do all your billing in my case, all your invoices, all your hand? Yep, everything. Now, um, I, the initial uh, invoice I send is usually in law pay if I can. Law pay has a, a better uh, rate for um, payments. Their processing fee is, a, is less than my case. So for that initial payment, I usually will do a, a invoice in um, law pay, but I do. Do they integrate, right? Does it integrate? It does not integrate. That's the one downside yes. to my case is they have what's called a closed API, which means they don't integrate with anybody. So you can't do, you can't use Zapier. It doesn't integrate with anything. It's a, it's a self-contained application. That's the one thing that I don't like about my case, honestly. Right. And I found that as well, because uh, I was having trouble with Except QuickBooks. It does integrate with QuickBooks. Right. Yeah. In my, my case, you, it does have its own credit card processor, uh, which I had some issues with last year and I did move to law pay, but then I'm doing two separate. Yeah. That's the pain in the butt is the, is the extra step of um, logging the payment in my case when they've made the payment in law pay. All right, so let's talk about actual running a virtual law firm at this point. So first you have intake. How does your intake process go from the time a new prospective client reaches out to you or contacts you up to the time that you do an interview or consultation to retaining? Let's call that all step one. How does that work in your office? So the client would either, I get a lot of people through social media, but then also people may go to the website or people may call. So no matter how, which door they come in, they are all roads are going to lead them to my client concierge. So like when you say social media, do you mean like Tinder? No. <laughs> okay. That's I you, mean, Ryan. <laughs> I mean, Instagram. Instagram is probably my number one platform. Instagram, um, Facebook, Instagram and Facebook. And, um, and so whether they come through Instagram, Facebook, call or land on the website, all roads are going to lead them to the client concierge. And she is going to um, have, if they, if they went through the website, they filled out a web form. If they call, she's going to get their information and send them the web form. And we are going to do what we call an internal um, evaluation to determine whether they're a good fit for the firm. And that just means if they're looking for a criminal defense lawyer, well, I don't even do that. So we're not going to waste her time or my time putting you on the calendar. We'll just get you a referral. So we do a pre-qualification. She'll do a pre-qualification. And then based on what they, whatever it is that they need, she's going to sell them. She's a salesperson. So she's going to sell them into a paid consult. I'm not getting on the phone with anybody for free. I have done that for way too long and I'm not doing that anymore. So she sells them into a um, 30 minute consultation for $200. They get, they get um, and that's booked through Calendly, which is my online calendar. And that they pay, they make their payment right there when they make the, when they um, book. And they are gonna get an email that tells them, reminds them of the call and it has the Zoom link. Calendly integrates with Zoom so uh, it, it assigns a new um, meeting ID for every meeting. So I don't have to worry about, you know, other people popping in. How do they pay through Calendly? Because I've set up Calendly as well. Um, how, how, what does that integrate with? Is that law pay? It integrates with Stripe and PayPal. Okay. Either one. So do you have, so you created Office, Stripe, and or PayPal accounts in addition to your processing? Correct. Yep. Okay. 
So they uh, make their payment and then we meet for the, um, we'll meet on Zoom and we have a meeting. And during that meeting, I'm going to sell them into whatever legal services it is that they need, whether that's a, a trademark, um, contract review, whatever. And, and then, go ahead. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go. Oh, I was, I was going to ask you. So, who, who's your concierge? Is that, is that Ring Central that someone does it, or do you have somebody in your office who's in charge of that? No. So, there's someone on my team, a, a woman I've never met before, and she lives in Oklahoma. She's a virtual. Every person on my staff is virtual. There is no. Are you like strike one? There could be tornadoes by you. Like, is that a strike or is that okay? <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Okay. I just want to make are sure. They, are they contract or are they employees? Everyone, everyone that works for me is, is a contractor. I have no employee. I'm the only employee of the firm. So all of my staff is uh, virtual. So how many attorneys do you have, Nikki? It's you. Is it you and one other? Two, right? And two others. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues that I've run into in my office is so we'll have I don't know how many, I have six or eight practicing attorneys right now. And sometimes somebody will contact us, say for a family law matter, but they don't know who they want to go to, or a business litigation matter, and they don't know who they want to go to. So, you know, we have different people who feel those. What I've started doing from the social media end, because not, all, not everyone in the office does social media, both on the website and on our um, firm Facebook page, I've integrated a built-in chat feature. Um, and I don't know if you've done this. I find this to be awesome. So people contact me, it goes right to my phone. And hey, I'm looking for this. And boom, right then and there, I can go back and forth. Because a lot of people, a lot of potential clients at this point, even wealthy ones, they don't want to get on the phone right away. They want the email, they want a text. And I have somewhere I think they're spam and they turn out to be multi-million dollar cases. So, you know, this is my little tidbit as part of the intake is these chat features. And Instagram's great. I get a lot of these direct messages. The problem for me is a lot of my Instagram potential clients, they don't pan out for, for my firm, you know. But, but in terms of Facebook, and certainly on the website, I have something right away. As soon as you go to my website, it pops up. How can we help you? And I made the mistake of directing them all to me, probably because I'm type A and a control freak. But they all go to me, and boom, I can send off. I know whether it's a case for my associate, whether it's a case for my, my business law partner. You know, right. um, That helps, because I agree. You need to have somebody off the bat who feels these before you do it. You can't just go on the phone with everybody. Yeah. So where did you find this virtual assistant? Is there a website, a company? Oh, yeah. So there's lots of them. I mean, you can do it on, um, I've used Upwork.com. I've had a lot of success with Upwork. That's the very first one that I used. In fact, it used to be called um, Odesk is what it was called a long time ago. Elance is what it was called, Elance. And they changed their name to Upwork. So you can get lots of people on Upwork. My latest and my absolute favorite, and I will give you all this with my affiliate link, is HireMyMom.com they have turned out to be the absolute best, like almost everybody on my staff right now, I found through HireMyMom.com. The quality of the um, contracted freelancers, they have people from every, you know, they're not, if you're looking for someone with a lot of legal experience, you're going to have a tougher time on Hire My Mom. You might, their, their audience isn't full of paralegals, but Upwork is going to be better if you're looking for someone on the legal side. But if you need someone for bookkeeping, if you need someone, you know, um, client intake is not legal. I mean, that's that's sales and customer service. So, you know, that's not a legal. Um, one of my current pair, actually, two, both of my paralegals right now are both from uh, um, from hire my mom, which is an anomaly that that was that was by happenstance that it doesn't happen often because most of those people don't have, and it takes me a little longer. I get fewer applicants for the um, legal positions, but. Nakia, do you know if they have a firemymom.com? <laughs> because my mom works in my office and I was looking to try to figure out a way to do it. If there's someone called firemymom.com, that would be helpful perhaps at times. Brian, you are hilarious. So Fire sure, My Mom <laughs> is full of work from home moms. It's, it's okay. full of people. So here's what I want to say to anybody who's thinking about hiring um, a virtual person. You've got to find people who are already experienced at working from home because not every, it's a skill set that not everyone has. People that are in their jobs and they're miserable and they want, they claim that they want to work from home aren't always the best fit because they don't understand what it means and what it takes to be organized, to be self-disciplined, to be self-motivated and to work from home. So um, I have found that the quality of applicants that are on 
you know, a hire my mom tend to be people that are already in this field. They are, you know, now it's going to little be, be a little different because with the pandemic, everyone has had to get used to working from home. But for those people who are, they, they tend to be very tech savvy. Um, they've done this. They've worked for other, other um, entrepreneurs before. So they tend to be a little better quality. So that's where I get all my books. Do you know any, what about virtual bookkeeping services? Do you know about any of those? I think, so I have, I had a client that speaks very highly at bench.com. Um, I am a more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of person. So I would say, and my bookkeeper who's virtual, I found on Upwork, I would, I would post a, a um, custom posting for what you need, especially with us being lawyers. And if you're dealing with trust accounting, you want someone who's had experience doing that. There's tons of bookkeepers. In fact, the first one that I had was a bookkeeper at a traditional law firm that was looking for some extra, you know, she knew how to, she ran the books at her firm. She was looking for, you know, something a little extra on the side and it worked out great. Once my needs got bigger, it was, you know, a bit too much for her. So I've got someone different, but I would definitely say Upwork for um, a bookkeeper. The virtual services, I feel like when they're too generic, I, I want someone that I can say specifically, here's what I need. These are the reports that I need on a weekly basis. I wanna see um, certain things. I think you, you're better off just hiring a freelancer, a freelance bookkeeper to do that. Okay, so now you've we've done intake, we've got done you up intake. to speed, you're in. Okay, now let's, let's go to phase two, which is current clients. Do you, do you use my case to communicate with your clients, which I think you, you talk, you do staff with that. Do you communicate with clients? Is there a client portal? How do you find the most effective way to virtually, without having an office, or maybe having an office, but to virtually give um, this virtual workplace, sharing it with your client? What do you do? Sure, so we have a no email policy in my firm. Clients don't email us. All communication should happen in my case. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> don't email me ever okay do not email me all communication should happen in the and how do i sell this i know because people say oh if i told my clients that they wouldn't listen well i sell it to them by saying email is not secure google is not secure my case on the other hand is a ssl encrypted um ssl encrypted database and client portal that makes sure that all of our communications are protected so all communication should happen there. Even if they forget, if they email me, I copy their email, paste it in my case, and respond there and say, I'm responding to your email because I think you forgot you're not supposed to email me. And I do it that way. And here is why. Number one, I don't have time to be on emails all day. I get 500 trillion. And if it's in my case, the paralegal can respond to it. Because half the time, the question that they're asking is like something like, when's my mediation or where can I find a copy of this? Or did we hear back from opposing the opposing counsel or whatever that half the time I never even have to look at it. So that's one, um, making sure, sure that we communicate there and we train them by telling them in the welcome packet and in the welcome email, don't email us. <laughs> Everything should happen in my case. Um, Tell me about your welcome packet. Wait, what's, what's your welcome packet? So the welcome packet is very crucial, okay? Um, this really sets out the expectations. And so you, you, when you're virtual, you have to do a little bit of over-communicating to overcompensate for the fact that they didn't come to your office. So it's our way, all of those little touch points to make them feel, you know, like happy to spend their money with us. So the welcome packet explains to them, it introduces them to the legal team and it answers all those frequently asked questions. We talk about my case, we talk about documents, we talk about, we have, um, we're in the process of making it um, specific to the type of case because that's a, another level of service that'll make it even better. So in your case, Brian, if you've got a divorce case, their case is gonna look very different for someone who's doing a modification of custody. So you should have a welcome packet for divorces, a, a welcome packet for modification. Maybe even take it another step to if you are defending a modification or if you are defending a divorce, if you aren't the moving, you know, if you aren't the person that filed or whatever. So just making those little things are really 
um, very good in terms of keeping them abreast of what's going to happen. So we'll say in there, for example, I do trademarks. Trademarks take forever, but, but literally most of the time you're just sitting there waiting and nothing's happening. So I've told them that in the welcome packet. We will file your application within the next two weeks. Once we file, we will be in a holding pattern for at least three months before the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is going to assign an examining attorney to your case. Once they assign someone, they don't do anything for another six weeks. We will check in with you on the, by the fifth of every month to let you know what's going on. So that way you don't have to email us a million times. What's going on with my case? We've already told you that by the fifth, you're going to get something from us. Another plug for my case, I don't know if Clio does this, but it has the workflow. So once I activate that workflow for a trademark case, it's going to populate everything that needs to happen, all the tasks that happen for each client, you know, what is going to happen. And so there is for the client concierge a task every month to say, nothing's happening with your trademark case, Ms. Jones. And that way they'll, they won't forget to make that contact so all of that happens inside of my case do you call your like listen when you say client concierge is this what your clients refer to this yeah. this role as yes i love that they love I it love yes. i love that they love it so so that person is so her responsibilities are to um initially meet with the client or, or get them to where they need to go with whatever meeting they are meeting with me send the welcome packet do the check-ins. Um, I do still have a not so complete virtual part of my practice as estate planning. I still do that. And so three days a month we have um, we have in-person signings. So and the client concierge today cleared those three days for August with me. So now she knows them. So when the attorney or the paralegal is is done reviewing those documents and it's time for the signing. The client concierge is the person who's going to call Ms. Jones to arrange for her signing. So the, and then at the end of the case, she's the one that's going to call them to tell them their case is completed. We're going to be sending you your closing letter. Is there anything else you need from us? And we're going to be sending you a survey. We want to make sure that we did a good job for you. And then she'll use that to get a testimonial. So that's her job is to stay you know, as a concierge with the clients all the way through the case. So what kind of documents do you actually share with your clients? Do you share everything, like all your case notes, notes from when you talk to them? No, many cases have no documents whatsoever, but okay. that's the nature of my practice. But if I'm drafting contracts for them, um, or sometimes, you know, in a trademark case, you may have some email exchange between me and another lawyer if we're uh, fighting about something or something like that, if there's an, a settlement agreement. But the notes internally between me and the staff are not shared okay. with the client. And many clients have, have zero documents under their My Case file because there's just no documents for them to see. So now let, let's talk about an item that's not flat fee because like, like a trademark, I assume that's a flat fee. Flat fee. Almost everything for me is flat fee. Probate is the only thing not flat fee. So, so the client concierge, so you're not billing then. So for you, that helps. But how would that work for someone like Melissa and I, let's say that's on a billable hour? Obviously, if we want to have a client concierge, a lot of what you're talking, especially in family law, that's billable time. You know, a lot of our bread and butters are point ones. I mean, I, my associate is probably not listening. Andrew Wilson's on this call. He's the king of point ones. And, you know. Client concierge is a billable position. I had a client concierge. You, you know, I had family law until last year. So I, when I had family law, and in fact, they monopolized the client concierge with all their freaking calls and issues. And so that is absolutely a billable, uh, that's a billable role. Okay. And so, so the, and, and the role of them, I mean, are they handling like paralegal work, secretarial, anything across the board that's not a lawyer matter? Correct. Absolutely. And so they were definitely sending, um, you know, correspondence, uh, letters. I mean, every time the, those status letters or those status messages, those are all billable. They are definitely billable. Okay. I like that. Wilson, while you're listening, let's set up client concierge. All right, let's get back. Sorry, that's my <laughs> Um Okay, so so what else do we have? What else should we know about current clients? Or you know, I'll tell you what. 
have you been you've been doing a virtual law from while you were having litigation between probate and family law right mm -hmm. yep. what were the give us some more tips on litigation based practices let's talk about are there any other tools that were helpful preparing for court going to court dealing with clients dealing with judges whether it's staff or you do you have any other tips in that regard uh, so I would say with my case too, you and why don't you like the color pink? But you can get to that second. <laughs> um, when in dealing with um, in dealing with my case, you've also got Dropbox. So Dropbox is your online storage, and it integrates with my case. And so making sure that you have, I always use when I was um, litigating. I had an iPad. There's a my case app. There is. Um, Dropbox, it, it, there's an app so that in court, I've got those files there. We were still pay, we were still a paperless office even when I was, um, when I was doing uh, litigation. So the tools really aren't that different. I mean, uh, you know, my case was still, you know, the number one. Um, calendaring all, anything that came in, I mean, that was probably something that I don't have to deal with anymore, um, you know, in, as far as dates. But discovery was that happened all through my case. Um, when we sent discovery, we were it would be in a Dropbox. We would have a discovery folder within the um, file, and then there is the outgoing, and that's the link that we would share with um, with opposing counsel in terms of exchanging the documents. The clients actually, and the client concierge is great in discovery because they are the person that um, that would do the meeting you know, the discovery meeting um, to gather the documents. And so the client had a, a instruction to upload all of their discovery to my case. And so now the client concierge or the paralegal, whoever, whatever your staffing needs are, is gonna review that, organize it. All of that still happens right there in my case. Do you have like, for your client concierge, do you have like an outline of roles or duties of what they're supposed to do? Yes. Can I contact you after this? If I send sure. you like an email, it has like a, it has like a pink background and everything. If you just, I want to see what that does. Yeah. You don't have to share with any the others, just me. This is one of the perks. So. Yeah, I have, and I'll, and I'll give you this as a, as a tidbit for, for every bot, for every role. Um, one thing that I created, and I'm happy to share this with everybody is a, um, is I created like a, a form that lists everything that they are supposed to do. And then, and then it tells them when they're supposed to do it. So these are the things that you do daily. So, so just imagine a list of all this stuff down here. And then there's an X, there's across the top, it's daily, monthly, anytime, whenever, whatever. And so that way they know exactly what they should be doing. And so for associates, if we are, you are to, you're to go through the case list on a weekly basis, you should be looking at your case, cases to see what it is and what you need to do. So we've got that for the office manager. We've got that for the associates. We've got that for paralegals. We've got that for the um, client concierge. So it's very important when you are, yeah, and I think this is, rather you're brick and mortar or whether you're virtual, I do say, I do feel that having been um, a litigator in a brick and mortar office and also as a virtual, the communication is the number one piece. You've got to over communicate because in the office, I can just walk by her desk and say, oh, don't forget, we've got this today. But you don't have that. Um, you know, when you're when you're virtual, you've got to over communicate and, and the ability. And also, I will say the ability for anybody to pick up the case at any time is just so important. So everything's got to be in order. It's got to be in, in my case, everything has to be there. And we use status updates. So every time anybody does something, they give a status update. So then when a new person comes on, they can easily go down all the status updates to see everything that happened in the case. So it sounds like you're a little bit disorganized and not very high <laughs> day. Um, does that hurt you? No. <laughs> so, so I think all of us as lawyers are this type A, get things done, you know, overseeing. And that's probably one of the challenges of the virtual law place, because when you, at least if you're face to face, you know, you could look somebody in the eyes and yell at them until they cry. Right. But when you're doing it from a virtual standpoint, it's a little more difficult to oversee what people are doing. And, you know, I say that in jest, but, but at the same time, you know, I already know that my staff right now, we've not laid off anybody. We've not cut any hours. And I know that like 
there's certain people in my office that are working a fraction of the time, right? Have you experienced any challenges with this and overseeing a virtual staff? Because we got the virtual law firm, but what about virtual staff? So I think that it's all about the KPIs and, um, and having, everybody has responsibilities and they've got, if they're a billable, um, if they are a billable person, then they are going to have billable hour requirements. Um, and so in my case, you've got billable time, you've got non-billable. And so I, I, I have a, on this thing that I'm going to send you guys, it says part of their review or their KPIs, one of the things that they reviewed on is, what, is whether or not what percentage of their time is non-billable versus billable. I can't remember what it is. I want to say 80% of, what, 80 should, of their time each week should be billable billable to a client. Then I've got another measurement for time that has to be written off because they've overbilled and it, we can't really build a client for that. So all of that, you know, plays into it. And I think that you're, it's all about deadlines. When you have those workflows, like I said, when you're in a, um, in a flat fee, I don't even know if it matters if it's flat fee or not, even if it's hourly, if you've got benchmarks that the complaint should be drafted and sent to the client, two weeks from the date the engagement agreement is signed, or you've got to list every step, or the qu questionnaire needs to go out, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. If you can look in my case, or whatever your case management software is, to see what are the overdue tasks. Why is it overdue? And so one of the things that I had, I don't even have to do this anymore because everybody's trained so well, is that on Monday morning, they would have to send me their task list and ex and give me an explanation for anything when it's when it's overdue it's in red explain everything that's in red and so that's embarrassing like they don't nobody wants to do that so they're going to make sure that friday because all of our due dates i, I always do everything by friday because i don't want to micromanage people so you've got to get this done this week i don't care when where where you are however you do it it needs to be done by friday so if you've got a if you know you've got to send me an email on monday with all of your red tasks with an explanation you're going to make sure that you get it done and you're there's no emails coming to me on monday they're going to get it done i'm and a to-do list care. person I, I love a to-do a to -do do. list so i mean i've i've, I've been just using uh because i'm a solo i'm just using an apple you know product because that's what i've been using for my computer but you know i've seen there are others what asana, asana um, i use asana too I, I've seen people use that for their to-do list because they can collaborate. I've seen some people try to use Trello for their to-do list. I'm not a fan with Trello. I've tried Trello. Um, we are a big Asana family here. That's for my work on the business team, not the people that are inside the firm, but the people that are working on the business, my marketing team and project. Right. We use Asana. I'm big on Trello for like big picture ideas. Here's yeah. the stuff I want to put on my website, you know, yeah. each tab and things like that, um, or marketing or things like that. But, uh, you know, uh, and Asana, it integrates with some of the other platforms, correct? Like I've been trying Microsoft Teams, although I, the team is me right now. Yeah. Well, you know, I started, even when you're a solo, when I, I started with Asana, when it, it was just me, just mm -hmm. to keep myself organized. And I used Asana for for everything um and it is really good just to see it and to uh and to be able to you know it also integrates with uh, we use our email system we use gmail mm -hmm. and, uh, and asana has an extension so that if you get an email that it requires you to do something you can click that asana extension and then it will put that email over into asana on your to-do list asana and trello differ from like a slack because there's so many of these variants, right? I know they're all different, but they're also somewhat similar, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Slack and Microsoft Teams seem to have a lot of similarities with yeah. that, almost like a real-time chat feature. You can integrate with videos. Yes, um, Slack is just conversation and, co and, and um, communication. Asana is to-do list. That is where we have like my our content calendar. So what we're going to be posting on social media is there. It's um it's task project management, but Slack. So Slack is the equivalent of my Boxer. I use Boxer instead of Slack, but it's just communication. Okay. 
Um, you also mentioned Zapier earlier. Do you use that? I do. We do. We have to use that. Um, and it's it, you can actually do a lot of cool. I'm nerdy into tech stuff like that, but you can do a lot of cool things. Zapier is an interface that allows um, different platforms to talk to each other if they don't normally talk to each other, right? So for example, um, our email, we didn't talk about email, man um, email um, management, and I'm talking about not one-on-one -on -one emails, but mass emails when you're doing marketing yeah. emails or newsletters. So I use a platform called Drip for that. And Drip can integrate with Calendly. Drip? Yeah, G, G, D R I P. So like a drip campaign. And so I use drip for my emails because I like it. it, it you've heard of Infusionsoft, I'm sure. It's, it's like a baby Infusionsoft. Um, and it, it's getdrip.com is the website. Oh. And it tags people. Um, you can segment your audience and it does all kinds of things you know, for automation. But I like that because with Calendly, for example, you can send just one email when they book. But I want to have like an email nurturing sequence, gearing them up for that meeting. And so um, they can, that happens in Drip. So they get that initial email from Calendly. Now they are added to Drip and they're added to the whatever kind of case they have strategy session. So they get an automated email that kind of talks about me and talks about the firm just kind of warming them up for the sales meeting that they're going to have, the consultation that they're going to have with me. Um, so Zapier lets you do you know, all of those things. And it even works with like Google documents. If you, um, when I was doing family law, there was a, um, a um, I used to get leads from um, unbundled attorney. Uh, I don't know if anybody has used them, but they, uh, they send these, uh, their cold leads from the internet and you had to get back to them right away. So I couldn't always do that. So Zapier, I had created a spreadsheet that would automatically put them there and created a zap that they would get an email sequence with the calendar link to book the consultation. So those are lots of little automated things you can use with Zapier. But Zapier is, is advanced and I don't wanna scare people with it, so. No, I tried it and I stopped trying it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to scare you off with that. It's a lot. Okay. That's, that's next level stuff. Next level stuff. Okay. There's lots you can do without Zapier. <laughs> no, but you know, my, my concern wasn't why I attempted it in the first place is because it seems like I have a million and one different tech tools. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. I mean, I, I, unless I get into a routine where I know I'm going to my email for this and this and that, and right. I know what to have open first thing in the morning, my fear, of course, is that I'm going to forget to check something right. and then I'm going to miss something. And I don't want to do that. And that's why the case management software is great because you can really do everything just in my case. You really don't have to have any. Or whatever your case management software. Or whatever your case, yeah. Right. Yeah, it makes me feel bad that you really don't like this my case. I feel like if you liked it, it would help us out a little bit more. <laughs> you know? um, okay, give us a few more because we're running out of time. Anything else? Add something. Go. Okay, we talked about staffing. We've talked about the team. We've talked about um, intake. We've talked about how we're delivering the services. I think we've covered everything. I think that the, 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 the main thing is, and whether you use um, my case, Clio, or no case management at all, I think having the system, the workflow, what happens from here to here, who is doing what by when is what you should do. It will make your life so much easier. It doesn't have to be in a pretty format like a, a, in a case management software, but taking, um, you know, kind of like, like Brian walked me through their client, then their current client or whatever. You should do that for every type of case. And you could just do that on a Google document if you want. H how do people go from being an inquiry to being a client? And what is every single step that happens in their case? And who is responsible for doing that step? And the more you can do that and make it makes it easy when you are bringing people on, um, 
to help you with those things because you can easily say, okay, out of these 50 things, you are responsible for the first 10 and you are responsible for the next 10 and you are responsible for these. And that way you can get to a place of, of automation and scaling because ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to be able to have other people working and things working for us while we're on Zoom. If for someone who wants to start using some of these tools to work at home and wants to get to a place where there might be a virtual lawyer or a full-time work at home lawyer, do you have any, what's the first step for them? What would you suggest? Baby steps? Baby steps, yes. And I would say the, the getting organized with the workflow is the first step because that's going to take you to all the other steps. You've got to get organized. Um, the other thing is, and I think that many lawyers wait too late to do this, and that is to hire someone, hire a virtual assistant. Do not think that you've got to know how Zapier and this and that and all these things talk to each other. That's not why you went to law school. Hire someone to do that. Um, delegating and staying in your own lane is the best thing that you can do. So I put up a website, Beyond the Bar Institute. If you could uh, end today by telling people a little bit about this. Sure, so I started Beyond the Bar Institute in 2014. Um, it's an online business school for lawyers where we talk about all the stuff that we've talked about today. Um, I have a monthly membership and I teach a masterclass every month on different topics. Ironically, the, the next one for August is on how to hire virtual staff and I'm gonna walk through um, the job posting, the descriptions, um, and that form that I told you all that I'm going to send you to help you. You know, the best thing you can do to set people up for success is to show them exactly what it is that you need them to do. And so I think that a lot of times we get overwhelmed, virtual law or not, with trying to do everything and thinking we have to know everything. And we don't, if you are there to practice law, let somebody else do bookkeeping, let somebody else do marketing, let someone else do social media. And the beauty of freelancers is that they don't, they can't sue you if you don't want to work with them anymore. They're not your employee. You say, look, I got five hours a week. I want you to post on Facebook for me for five hours and that's it. And so, you know, there's no real commitment there. And I think that a lot of times people um, just wait too late to do that part. So right. and that'd be lovely once COVID hit and a lot of people were faced with having to fire employees that they just exactly. adored. Oh, I know. Exactly. And I, on the other hand, have hired five people since March. Oh my. <laughs> Brian, you were, you were uh, getting really close to your camera. Did you have something you wanted to say to tie us up? I just reminded you guys of the website, firemyhub.com. So... What is it again? Am I losing signal? Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, you're you're all garbled, Brian, out in that wilderness that you are sitting in. That's, that's the trees. That's yeah. the trees. Do you, don't uh, don't even reply. dot com. Is that what you're saying? No, don't worry about it. Did you click it? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, I did click that in the chat. Great sorry, one. sorry, everyone, for Brian. That's a great one. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Did we have any questions from the from our participants? Well, I think uh, everyone's very interested okay, in the uh, list that you said you were going to send. If you send it to me, I'm happy to make sure others get it as well. Absolutely. But we're going to sell it for five dollars a copy, Nikia. All proceeds go to us. Um, no big deal. It's fine. It's all for good cause. <laughs> so Brian can get better internet service. Yep. <laughs> Uh, one person asked, any thoughts on uh, research, legal research? Sure. Uh, Westlaw, Thompson, Reuters, Fast Case. Yeah, but it's Susan. It's, it's, she doesn't, okay. Continue. Yeah, so I'm biased for sure because I was a Westlaw rep in law school. So I've, I've always just gravitated toward Westlaw. Um, and they have a, all of those um, have a, uh, Brian, brush your hair. <laughs> all of those have a small firm or solo version um, and resources. I think it's, um, one is practical law that Westlaw has. Um, and then Fast Case, definitely, um, you can use Fast Case, it's free. Not as robust um, 
but I, I am definitely more of a Westlaw. I feel, I know a lot of people are, people tend to be one or the other between Lexus and Westlaw. Personally, for me, I like um, Westlaw. I did do uh, a free trial with, um, I can't remember the name of, uh, Lexus Nexus has a version of that. It's for small firms and it's lots of forms based on your practice areas and all this stuff. It's along the lines of the practical law that I think they have in, with Westlaw. Um, I actually like court listener. If you do federal work. Oh, I've never done. I've never done. Yeah, that. actually, I just learned of it last week. And you can sign up for alerts. And actually, there's a uh, thing you can connect to your web browser so that if people are also have that attached to their web browser and they pull up things on Pacer to get documents, they can actually, uh, it all now populates to court listener. And so you can pull it up yourself. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check that one. Uh, Susan says, what about Contract Express and Haikyuu products? We are shopping this right now. I Join us know. next month when Susan Ohl comes on to talk about technology <laughs> software. I have never heard of Contract Express. Is that supposed to be like a uh, document assembly? Is that what it is? Oh. Susan knows sign language. Look. Now I use um, I use Business Docs with Wealth Council, so I have a subscription with them. Um, so I get a lot of the business docs through them. Um, my case has the ability to auto. They have document automation built in. So when once you get your forms in there, you just and the same things you can use that. But I've never heard of HiQ products. We've been living in the Stone Ages at my firm and trying to get in some more responsibility. Yeah, and a lot of the good thing is a lot of these things are usually offer a free demo. So you know, do that. I would definitely do it. Again, I'm really big on you using your time wisely. And so don't get into a, a cul-de-sac of doing a ton of that stuff. Great project for a virtual assistant is to, you hire someone who on a project basis to try out all of these things, sign up for the demos, take them and send you a list of pros and cons. And that way, you know, it's, it's you're off doing something that's more productive and it gives you an opportunity. I'm really big when it comes on virtual staff and I'm talk about this definitely in more detail at, on the masterclass next month, but I'm really big on trials. Like let's just, before I hire you to be my client concierge, I'm going to give you one project, get me 50 testimonials from these clients, give them one thing so that you can see how they work how they work with you, how, how receptive are your clients to them. And then if it works, great. If it doesn't, okay, thank you for that one project. I'll pay you for that and be on your way. Oh. Sounds like a good project for Brian's staff that doesn't have the work right now. <laughs> for sure. Exactly. Brian concierge. I mean, that's what I get from this. Don't forget that <laughs> list, Nakia. <laughs> yes, yes. So well, I want to thank you so much. We've kept you far too long and, you know, the storms are starting to roll into the DC area. So we want to get you back to where you need to go before you get stuck in the rain. But thank you. Uh, it's tremendous. And uh, this will be going up on YouTube, which is connected to our website at techtalklaw.com. And, uh, you know, next month, we will be meeting with an SEO, search engine optimization expert, who's gonna to talk to us more about driving more traffic to our law firm's websites. That's great. Make sure that I get that, because I'll definitely wanna be on that one. Fantastic. I'll make sure you're on our list. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for having me. This has been fun. Thank you, Nikia. You were wonderful. We appreciate it. All right. Melissa, you were about a six to seven. But that's okay. Everybody else filled in the filled in. I'll in. take it. Yeah. I'll take it. That's good for today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everybody else picks up the slack, so it's okay. You're fine. <laughs> Love you, well, Susan. Thank you.